to bring this meeting to order. Are there any uh, changes or additions to the agenda as presented? I do have a an addition of uh, session. Yeah, uh, executive session to discuss labor negotiations. And uh, I got the policing service committee update. Is there anyone else that has any additions or changes? I'm curious if there's any updates on the other committees because we posted spots, right? Sorry, I don't recall what they are off the top of my head, but I think we had a few. I that... don't have any updates for you. Okay. okay. Uh, it looks like Lois has a question. Go ahead, Lois. Yeah, um, Brian had, had told me he thought he could get the uh, Conservation Commission grant request for your endorsement, but I don't yeah. see it on the agenda. So if you have time, that would be great. Yes, we do. Thank you, Lois. Conservation grant. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Lois. Is there anyone else with any additions or changes? If not, is the board prepared to approve the meeting minutes of April 19th? And that there are two of them, the dog hearing plus the regular board meeting. So move, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion second. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Both, both aye. opposed. Motion passes. Rosemary, you've got the floor. <laughs> The only thing that I have for today is just the warrant. Okay, uh, I guess I'd look for board's pleasure. Uh, there's no liquor licenses or anything, right? Well, oh, those are all time? done. Everybody's okay. got their liquor license now. Look for a board's pleasure on authorizing the chair to go in and sign unless everybody wants to. So moved. A motion, do we have a second? Second. Motion is second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Those, those opposed? The ayes have it. Anything else, Rosemary? No, nope, that's all for tonight. Anybody got any questions for Rosemary? Okay, thanks, Rosemary. You're welcome. I guess, Brian, get into your uh, report for sing ups uh, personnel policy. All right. Uh, so, uh, he had brought up at our last meeting, uh, that there's some interest among the employees about changing to a, uh, a slightly different work schedule and working for 10 hour days to make up 40 hours rather than, uh, five, eight hour days, uh, under our personnel policy as written, um, employees receive overtime after eight hours of continuous work. Uh, so we need to, we'll need to modify the, the personnel policy to accommodate that. We have modified it in the past uh, to a very limited extent to allow for 10 hour days during the months of uh, July, August, and September. Uh, he would like that extended for uh, May and June as well. Okay, what's the board's pleasure? We uh, probably better stick with our current policy that we have, uh, seeing we're in the beginning of uh, union negotiations. Stick to the way it's already written, July, August, and September. Uh, I guess I would tend to agree with Mike uh, where we are just uh, starting uh, the labor negotiations, I'm hesitant to make any changes to our personnel file or personnel policy at this time. Uh, I would be hesitant to support it. Let's put it that way. Well, you two are doing, doing the uh, negotiating at this point, so I don't want to do anything to undercut you, and I don't disagree. So, yep, I support that too. Evan, any thoughts? 
Uh, I tend to agree with you and Mike on this one. Okay, uh, Hugh, I wouldn't say it's off the table. It's just not yet, not now. Yep. But, uh, that would still, per the personnel policy for starting in July, what was it, July, August, September, correct? Those three yes. months, yeah. So that still would be allowable. Okay, next item. All right, uh, next up, uh, replacing the public works, the more or less the foreman's truck uh, a little bit early. So this truck isn't really holding up and kind of performing as well as we'd like. Uh, we've gotten a little bit heavier due to use out of it recently. Uh, over the winter, you recall, we used as a, a substitute uh, salt vehicle for a little while, taking care of some of the roads. Uh, and it's been really useful for taking care of uh, some of the roads that are difficult to put one of our trucks down where it's a narrow road uh, that doesn't have a turnaround on. So we're getting pretty good use out of it, but it's, it's not really holding up the way we'd like. So he was asking if we can uh, replace it a little bit early. It would normally be, normally be replaced uh, next year and he'd like to replace it uh, this upcoming financial year. What's on the schedule for this year? Replacements this year uh, is the the salt truck, the smaller truck, and uh, one tandem. And this is our per first proper year with the the new tractor. So we have had a pretty good outlay or we will have a pretty good outlay in terms of total costs for this year. Um, we can manage it. Uh, we're saving a little bit of money uh, using the, uh, we were able to save a little, little bit of money with modifications we made to the purchase of the salt truck going with a slightly, slightly lighter duty than what we were going to have on the salt truck. We've saved some money there. Um, and uh, the truck itself, uh, we're still well under what we had budgeted to pay for it, uh, even if we replace it a little bit early. Um, but it does, it will have a slight overall negative impact on our uh, reserve fund. Can you talk in numbers? Can you remind me how much we saved in the salt truck? Did you guys get the attachment that I sent out? Yeah, we got it right a while ago, yeah. Yep. Just I get to also share that on the screen right now. Oh, 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 I see. Okay, thanks, Hugh. I hadn't read the whole thing clearly. So the basically what we need from the capital fund is 15,000 instead of what we had uh, Earmarked for next year of thirty-three thousand. Ultimately, um, yeah, we can afford it. It's you know we're going to have a decent um, we're going to have a decent expense. We'd have a decent expense on this, but we can afford it. I think it's a great idea. I think the, the concern I have is is when we uh, defer from our plan, which a lot of effort and time was put into building this, it has a cumulative effect, uh, compounding effect out through uh, the whole table. And if I remember correctly, Brian, from a discussion we had, we had uh, booked in this plan for a $300,000 greater, but yet they're coming out, uh, coming in at about 500,000. So we need to really dig into this and put some time into it and redo the whole table. If, if our grader is gonna be close to two X the price of what we had put in for. 
we are going to need a, a significant rework based on the increased cost of the grader. But it's not 200,000, it might be 100. But that's, that's me being very, uh, I'm allowing for some fluff in there because it may not be. I have been waiting for two salesmen to give me hard numbers and they haven't. But um, on the grid, I just told, yeah. So, <clears throat> but yeah, if we, I don't know, Brian, you said that we allotted like 275. Was that accurate? Uh, the greater was uh, 253. So it's going to be worth 75,000. So that gives us three and a quarter. So even if it's 400,000, which is worst case scenario, you're only talking 75,000, not a 200,000. But the problem is that does have a, a cumulative effect out through that whole table. If we take out an extra 75,000 or whatever it may be, but I guess before we jump to do anything out of cycle, especially, I think the board needs to uh, sit down and go through that whole capital equipment uh, fund and, and maybe readjust some numbers because if it's going to change the whole thing and our contribution to, uh, that we're going to have to make annually is going to significantly increase, then we need to start getting prepared for that as well. So you're trying to say, Eric, this uh, small purchase of this truck is going to throw a wrench in the works for every single thing? It, it has a cumulative effect uh, because we're bringing in a year earlier that it affects the whole table out through and it's not a huge amount, but it does affect it. And yet we know that there is some, our numbers in the current table uh, are not accurate for what a greater replacement is gonna cost. Okay, we're, we're not talking about a greater. Right now, no, as, as we all know, I, all... I know we're talking about this truck, but this truck is kind of a, a it's been problematic. And so we're starting to throw good money after bad on this truck. And so I think we just need to move forward with this truck. And I think that maybe Hugh will discuss some other things he has in mind, either tonight or in a future meeting. I trust. Is that the true statement, uh, Hugh? <clears throat> yeah. And I think the key thing is, to, to keep in mind, like at the bottom of my note that I sent out was, you know, we're looking to spend 16,000 this year. We will keep that truck. If everything goes great, we'll keep that truck a year longer. So uh, we're essentially saving 15, $17,000 in the long run because we're not going to be spending 33 next year. And I'm going to recognize more. I'm, I'm going to recognize Nat. I see he's been trying to, jump in thanks yeah um i see in the in the memo we've spent thirty five hundred dollars on the vehicle uh since february um is that it because it to me that seems like for a truck this age um that's kind of expected and keeping an, an extra year is gonna put us out further ahead than buying a truck early and and taking that depreciation again from the early end of the, of the truck's life cycle. I'm not seeing the savings, I guess. Mike? I think you, okay. you're gonna have a lot of, uh, not just necessarily uh, this upfront savings that you're talking about, but you're gonna have uh, savings because this truck is gonna be more versatile uh, and it's going to have uh, better uses and, and more uh, equitable um, with, with the time of the employees. Uh, they're going to uh, accomplish more with this truck. Um, I think we're throwing mo good money after bad on the other one. I think this is a, a good truck that Hugh has uh, brought forth. He's got the numbers for it. Uh, I think we ought to just go ahead and do it. And I'll be pretty disgusted if we don't, to tell you the truth. Anyone nope. else has something? I agree with you, Eric. I think that if we're going to consider it, we need to consider what the total capital impact is. And if we know that the greater is going to come in 
at a much higher cost than we expected. My question is what else falls into that category and things we're looking to purchase in the next year or two? Um, because that could dictate how we buy anything, uh, whether it is in the plan or not, um, including this truck. It's really, it, it's really going to. I, I, I think equipment costs across the board for us are just gonna be spiking in the next couple of years. And when we have a, an option to save a little bit of money um, or to not spend a little bit of money, I think um, we need to stick with a plan. And I do appreciate, this is the second idea that we shot down already in the first 15 minutes of the meeting. I do appreciate the idea coming forward and I, I don't mean to just dump on an idea that somebody put a lot of work into. And I, I would not say it's, it's shot down. Um, what I would like to see is the numbers. I'd like to see the impact of the full uh, uh, capital equipment fund and uh, Brian, I mean, this is a sp another meeting that we need to dedicate just to the capital equipment fund. I mean, we can't just willy nilly trade things out of cycle because we've got it all planned out. And, and I think we need to sit down and have those new numbers for a grader, have the new numbers if there is for a dump trucks and put this in for a replacement this year and then see how it, it, the whole thing trickles out through. We need to talk about leasing vehicles. Well, that could be part of the discussion. Yeah, well, this truck, uh, Hugh, this truck is available right now, correct? Yeah, I was looking, I, I went through a lot of dealerships looking for something that was on the lot that would make the most sense. <clears throat> Just keep in mind that, you know, this other vehicle that I'm proposing is a vehicle that's going to take the um, natural abuse that plowing and whatnot um, throws our way. So, you know, ultimately by going to that, we shouldn't be in this position four years from now. Um, <clears throat> I never would have bought this truck to begin with, but I'm sensing a pattern that I don't do things the same way as my predecessor. So, um, yeah. So, um, but you know, whatever you guys want to do. You know, if, if we want to defer this for uh, when we've got the total expense, you know, we should have that soon at least. Um, you know, it was, we had hoped to be able to do it all at once, but we couldn't and felt that the opportunity of possibly getting a commitment to make this replacement uh, early was worth bringing it before the board. Um, yeah, this will have a low impact on our our capital equipment fund, but not none. And we don't know what the other factors, we don't know the full extent of what the other factors are yet. Um, and I honestly have the money in my budget left since it was a decent winner um, to cover it, but uh, just in my conversations with Brian, he didn't think that would be necessary. I think that's an interesting point because, I mean, we're closing in on the fiscal year and is that something that should be considered? Because if it's not going to disrupt the capital expense, uh, the capital plan, um, and we do have the money available in uh, surplus, on his operating budget, why wouldn't we consider that? Thank you, Beth, I appreciate that. Rosemary, how do we stand from uh, the big picture look on the whole budget? Give me a second to grab Rosemary. Okay, there you go, Rosemary. Should be able to unmute now. Okay, can I think overall we'll be fine. So if we took this as an expense out of this year's budget, uh, knowing that uh, he was the highway department's underspent, um, you think it would be fine? 
instead yes. of taking any of it out of the capital equipment? Yes. Okay. If I can make a suggestion for our kind of records and our use, uh, I would suggest making the purchase out of the capital fund and then increasing from our end of year, making an additional contribution to the uh, yep. the source of the capital fund. Yeah. Yeah, it's a money in, money out. Yeah, yep. it'll amount to the same thing on paper, but records wise, equipment costs that are relevant to the capital equipment fund should come out of the capital equipment fund. Mike? We, we can't forget that uh, you saved us about $20,000 too on the last truck. So oh, you, you was doing an excellent job looking after the finances of the town. And uh, I think we need to go forward with this truck. That That is not unusual though. We typically uh, budget for a higher cost and less trade-in value. However, our trade-ins have usually driven a much higher trade-in because of the way they've been kept. No, Eric, he changed trucks from what we were originally going to do and saved the town 20,000 bucks. That, uh, yes, you're right. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Don't, you don't need to cloud it with all of those other figures. You saved the town 20,000 bucks, period. That's true, and that's and that's appreciated. Um, but that doesn't mean that I have to go along with. <laughs> yes, Nat, I know, but don't be penny wise and pound foolish, please. I, I I'm not. I still don't see. I, I still don't see where the savings. So. Well, he can still pay for it out of uh, this year's money, so it's no big deal. It's still money being spent. That we, well, well, it's I, true, I, but we're getting a better product. You know, uh, okay, well, I've, I've, I've let my views be known, so I'm okay with that. I mean, we just, you have to realize, Hugh, if we allocate this money out of the current year's budget, that means that much less money for the part-time help that you were thinking you might use. I don't think it does because my part-time help was never going to increase um, you know, I was taking it from one part-timer and it was going to another. So it never really fluctuated my budget at all. The concept of adding that part-timer, if I'm understanding it correctly. Okay. Very good, Hugh. Well, what's I mean, I think this, Eric, I guess my, I think the bottom line is there's a lot of money impacting a lot of different places. And to see that, to actually see the financial impact in, in those different areas. I can't tell you all the areas that we've saved money or spent more money uh, in Hugh's budget, you know, talking about this right now. And if to Nat's point, um, if we can't see that there is, that we're not spending more money ultimately, then should we be making this decision to the point Mike's trying to make, if we are saving money then let's save the money. But I mean, I don't see, I see these line items very specifically, but I don't see the bigger picture and how it impacts all of our different budgets. So I think that I, well, I would really like some clarity before we decide what to do here. Okay, so we, we do have a proposal from our uh, public works supervisor. Uh, you know, there's certainly some hesitation from some board members, including myself, on going out of the cycle until we do see the full impact. I would like to suggest that our next work session meeting be dedicated to going through the capital equipment uh, fund and uh, our plan, as well as uh, whether we do this purchase this year. What's the rest of the board's thoughts on that? Eric. Yes, go ahead, Mike. Beth, about uh, five, 10 minutes ago, you, you said if, uh you could pay for it out of this year's budget, you were going to support it. Didn't you say something to that effect? I know what I said. I said, why wouldn't we discuss it if we can pay for it out of the operational budget? I didn't say we should do it. I said we should discuss it. And I think that we still need to understand the financial impacts in all areas and what that means ultimately. I guess I must have misunderstood you. I thought you were supporting it. That's why I thanked you. <laughs> Can retract your thanks, no problem. <laughs> no, I won't take it back. 
But I do think we should need to go forward with this as soon as possible because we don't know what's going to happen by the time we study this stupid thing to death. The truck could be gone. Now, if we can pay for it now with no uh, cost out of next year's budget, we need to pay for it now and get the truck, period. That's the trouble. This board has to study everything to death all the time. You know, it gets a little old. Okay, Mike, we hear what you're saying. Is there any other board members' thoughts? I think Evan's raising his hand. Oh, okay, I can't see but Evan. Sorry. You're all uh, um, <clears throat> Have you spoken to salesmen about potential price increases and everything? And I guess uh, more a preferential question for you slash research or something. Um, said you looked at Ford and GM. Is that just out of price range or they just don't have it available right now? looked at all manufacturers who would build a product, who build a product that we would use. Um, Ram, GM doesn't give a municipal discount. Um, Ram gives a pretty hefty one. Ford didn't have anything that we were looking for. The, everyone seems to be low on inventory right now, which I think is one reason why our uh, trade-in value is so high. I didn't think that we were going to get more than 22, 23,000 out of that truck. But the salesman said, you know, they're low on used inventory as well. They're not just shipping everything up to auction like they used to. Um, so the fact that they offered us 30,000 <clears> for a truck that we paid 35 for four years ago, was pretty astounding to me. Um, I think just like the housing bubble, pretty soon those trade in values are probably going to drop. I don't know when that's going to be, but uh, I know a couple of years ago when I was trying to trade my truck in, they were offering me, you know, they give you an insulting trade in value. Um, so the fact that they literally came in seven or $8,000 higher on the trade in value. Um, so I thought that was pretty remarkable. <clears throat> Do I feel that's going to be a different a month from now? I probably not, but um, it, that's, I'm more worried about, our trade in value dropping significantly than I am losing a particular vehicle that happens to be on a lot. Um, it seems like if you tell a dealer you're hot after a certain thing, they manage to go find one for you. Um, but I know every guy said that if they ordered something, it'd be six, eight months out now, which is kind of what Clark's told us initially on our chassis. So um, yeah, I mean, I, the reason I can afford it out of my budget is because we had a light winter. I went and stocked by backfilled our sand pile um, already and used those funds. So um, between salt savings and sand savings, I have a surplus in those two categories. So that would allow me to make the purchase out of my budget if I had to. Um, so, you know, I, if I didn't think this was a good idea, I wouldn't pitch it to you right now. Those, those savings would, and, and I, I understand, I appreciate that, you thank you. I, but I, I think the savings we're talking about could really go a long way towards filling that $75,000 gap that we have with the, with the planned purchase of the greater. Um, so instead of spending that, that money today, maybe we look out for the taxpayers not having to raise taxes in future years to, to cover that, that gap. Mike? Everybody seems to be talking about this greater all the time. Uh, you and I had a discussion the other day and we were talking about leasing. If I can't, if I'm uh, be so bold as to say we had a discussion with you uh, about leasing. And uh, Hugh has some good points about leasing. Uh, at least it's an amount of money, it's a fixed amount that we know uh, what it's gonna cost us for our budgets. And uh, they are under warranty. And when you're done with them, they just take them back and you get another one. So this greater uh, might not even be on the discussion because who knows, we may decide to lease the next greater. But 
we can't even think about that greater. We need to think about this truck that's before us. And uh, we are leaving a lot of this into Hugh's hands. And as I said before, he saved us considerable money on that other truck. Uh, and he does everything with a, the greatest amount of thought. At least we could do is let him have this truck tonight. <clears throat> Something else to keep in mind is we don't necessarily need to replace that greeter when the time comes. Um, it's a solid machine. You know, I, I'm going to do a lot more research on what our best avenues are, including whether or not we even replace it at the time. So I'm, I'm not even thinking about the greater right now. I'm, I'm, I've been doing research well ahead of time and we'll cross that bridge when we get there in a few months. But I think if we go into the capital equipment uh, plan, that all of those kind of things is what we would be looking for, the lease versus purchase, uh, what the long-term effects of that is. I mean, those are all things we would wanna see when we do set up our, our uh, capital equipment funds. Um, and the plan I support, to, to go ahead, Beth. I support your idea of using our next working session to work through this. And I, Hugh, I support it mostly because I would like to get your input on all of those lines and whether we should make adjustments or not and what the impact of those adjustments would be. Um, so truck and everything else. And it would be uh, probably the best efficient for the board if, if you and Brian sat down and, and put together a plan, including swapping the truck, the pickup that you want to swap, do that this year, push out the grader if you feel it can be pushed out. And then that whole uh, lease purchase question should be incorporated, whatever, which way you think would be the, the most sense on the long term. And then bring that before the board so the board can make uh, you know, a decision based on all of the information. Let's have this uh, work session real soon. I'm thinking our next work session meeting, unless we get something on the uh, horizon we need to get done that you can think of, Brian. No, uh, I think that that will be fine. Okay. Um, I know we've got one hand up. Is there any further board members comments before I go to the public? I just have one last request, which is if that results of your work could be shared, you know, at least three, uh, four or five days ahead of time, I would like to look at now. I, I like to look at the numbers, and if I don't have time to really think about it, I, I look at them, think, go away, and think about it, and then I come back to them. And I'd like to go through that thought process before we get into the meeting, so I'm not, you know, asking questions like I'm asking tonight, and I'm better informed. Understood, Beth. Thank you. And I would also add that probably for that meeting, uh, Rosemary would need the uh, up to the date where we are in the budget to as a whole, if we're gonna especially use uh, current operational uh, funds to support this. Yeah, so I'm imagining for that meeting, uh, we'll prepare a report for on the uh, kind of the, the budget status report for end of the year with end of the year projections where we currently are and where we think we're going to finish out the year. And yeah, then we'll also do, uh, we'll look at the, the document for the capital equipment fund and we'll do the, uh, the capital reserve fund uh, balance sheet kind of in detail. And with the next, we normally project that out uh, 11 years at a time. Um, and so we'll make that the projections in your board packet now, but we'll go into that in more detail uh, and have the scenarios that we described for the greater uh, of regular replacement, uh, delaying the replacement or leasing. Perfect. Okay, unless there's any further board member comments, I will look to Kyle. Okay, there you go, Kyle. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't really have any brand new points. A lot has 
already been discussed, but I think that this is just a healthy discussion in the sense that we have a new foreman and clearly he's got a different perspective than maybe the one before. And it's probably just a really good exercise regardless of, of uh, the need before you right now to, to just look at that um, plan. Because Eric, I remember <laughs> we slogged through that plan and, and came up with, with um, these timelines for, for a reason to be good words of taxpayer money and to be just really, you know, responsible in, in these major purchases. So um, yeah, I think it's always a healthy exercise, especially with a, a, a newer person in this position to kind of zoom out and have more of a, um, yeah, a, a, you know, long look at the, the long-term picture here and what the, the need is for right now. So um, yeah, that's all I want to say. I, I, I support the work session and I'm getting uh, Zoom bombed. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Kyle. And just to echo what she said, she's absolutely correct. You know, Q, you're on board now. There is insights that you would have and you should look at our whole plan as well as uh, we got two board, new board members who have not had the pleasure of sitting through that as well. Okay, if there's no further comments, Nat, did you have something? Nope, thank you. Uh, and no further public comments, but we'll plan on that for a, our next work session meeting. Procurement policy. All right, and here this isn't, uh, you might be interested in this one and our uh, class four road policy, um, but you don't have to stay stick on it for the whole meeting if you don't want to. Um, let's see, the procurement policy. So I've included in your packet, uh, the League of Cities and Towns kind of advice about a procurement policy and then a draft I've made of uh, what we might take adopt as a, a procurement policy for Johnson, uh, which is mostly VLCT's program with uh, for just a formatting change to make it a little bit easier to navigate and a little bit more consistent with the uh, way we've written more, uh, some, some of our recent policies. Um, so I guess first I wanna talk about procurement policies in general. Uh, so this is this would be a policy that would state under what circumstances we go out for a request for a proposal uh, or, or a similar process for um, purchases over a certain amount versus when is it something that we just need to have talk to the board about? When is it something we need to get, uh, you know, maybe solicit a couple opinions about? And when is it something that, you know, one of our designated agents can just purchase without seeking any prior approval. Um, we have pretty good practices around this, you know, that, um, you know, Rosemary uh, has done a great job historically about uh, managing and controlling the way that we spend money and that's been adopted uh, by myself and by Hugh and everybody who's kind of come into the, uh, come into the town, but we don't have an uh, adopted policy for this. The reason that I'm seeking a, in particular a policy around this is that uh, it would make things easier when we're receiving funds from other entities, in particular the federal government, when we apply for federal money, uh, they wanted part of their standard request is to see our adopted procurement policy, which we don't have. Um, usually through discussions, we can talk through it show examples, so what our practices are, and uh, you know, we haven't ever been denied anything because of our lack of an adopted procurement policy, but it's, it's always a conversation that we don't have. Um, so I'm interested in at least having the discussion about um, you know, the, that this could make things easier when it comes to uh, our interaction with um, with other agencies, with the federal government, with the state government. Uh, and I think this is also a really good thing to do as we're about to receive a lot of that, those ARPA funds, uh, which 
you know, we're going to have to do a lot of demonstration about how we've spent those money and how we've tracked them, what they've gone to, and that we used good practices in how we allocated those funds. So does anybody have any questions about procurement policy kind of writ large rather than the specific one, but about the nature of the policy in general? Okay, so I'm gonna get into the specifics of, of what I've written out here for us. So in our policy, uh, one of the biggest things is just setting um, what are the, the limits. Uh, this is, is, you know, I think we generally all agree on this. Uh, you know, I listed our purchasing agents, which are currently the people who are allowed to purchase things on our behalf, um, you know, which is myself, public works supervisor, recreation coordinator, and the town clerk. So that's myself, Q, Rosemary, and Lisa. Incidental purchases, things that we don't really need prior approval for, would be uh, $500 and less. Um, those are, you know, th those are, are just routine purchases. Um, you know, I'm having a hard time thinking of, of a great example for this, but I would think of, you know, that's, that's kind of our office supplies and our routine things that we're just buying and purchasing every day, uh, normal items. And again, all these purchase limits, it has to be within budget. If we ever go over budget for anything, then it warrants a, at least a board discussion. Minor purchases. Uh, so this is stuff that uh, we're not taking out to bid. We're not going to get competitive quotes. We're just going to go ahead and make the purchase. That would be 500 to $2,000. Major purchases is all purchases over $2,000 require prior, prior approval of the select board. Um, so that's anything, um, you know, $2,000, we've got to talk to the board. Then we get into some smaller details. From 5,000 to 10,000, we have to get at least two qualified vendors to submit bids on it. That's not necessarily taking out an ad in the paper and you know, request writing a whole RFP and going through the public opening process and all that. That's just a, you, we've got to have a good idea that we're getting a fair price on whatever we're ordering. The next level up is uh, $10,000 or more. We have to get a sealed, we have to follow the sealed bill sealed bid process. Uh, that's, you know, already something that we have to do with federal funds and it's, it's good practice. This is about the limit where we've set it ourselves, but, um, you know, this just kind of outlines exactly how we're doing and exactly what the process is. Uh, the last part, and this is one where I've varied I'd say pretty significantly from the way that it's written in the uh, uh, the, pro, uh, the the draft policy is I've said um, for, if we exceed two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars, then we have to. Uh, sorry, it's under bid specifications. Uh, it's in excess of five hundred thousand dollars is when we have to bond the project. And so we'd have to obtain a bond to secure the completion of the project. Uh, in the original draft that VLCT recommends, they want that for any construction project. And I think that that's gonna be really burdensome to us and not a great use of our time and funds. It's gonna make everything pretty expensive. So I'd really like to set a threshold on that so that we're not doing it for every construction project. We're only doing it for construction projects that exceed a, a certain amount. Uh, and I put 500,000 in there as a 
just to pick a threshold. The bid process itself, again, this is really similar to what we already do. Um, all the things in here are uh, things that we put in when we go out for a request for bid right now or a request for proposals when we go through the process of examining, you know, they have in their insurance, that they're responsible, that they have references, that they've done this kind of work before. And uh, then we get into, we open the bids at a public meeting, we discuss them, and we have a rationale for why we selected it. The rationales are the same rationales that we've understood and that we've used, that price is a good rationale for choosing something. It's kind of the best rationale. It's easy to articulate and it's a responsible use of the public's money. If we're not, if we're choosing something that's a more expensive one, we've got to be able to establish why. We've got to be able to articulate why is this important? Does it meet our values about, you know, spending money locally? Uh, is, do we have a reason to believe that this is going to be a better quality product for the amount that we're bidding and the amount that we're paying for it. Um, you know, is, is there, are there other factors and can we articulate? Goes into a little bit more detail about um, recurring purchases, about making purchases that require or that rely on particular expertise, you know, that if they're Basically, if we have something that there are just not that many people qualified to do, if we need something that's highly specialized, we have an avenue for saying like, look, there, there's just nobody else. There's only one person who's qualified to do this. We're, we're going with them. Uh, but we have to, again, follow a certain procedure for uh, making that determination and articulating that there's a reason we're not following our regular bid process. I think that pretty well outlines what our what the the draft does and our reasons for uh, my reasons for suggesting. Um, again, this is not a major variation from what our existing practice is. It just puts particular dollar amounts on exactly when we go from requiring competitive quotes to requiring a bid or scaling down of a purchase that we can just one of our designees can just make. Okay, so I would just uh, put it before the board. Uh, is there anyone who sees reasons why we would not simply adopt this? It's basically a practice that we have in place. It's a, a, a leak boilerplate policy and we've by and large supplemented Johnson into it. And as it is a policy only, we can change it at any time. But if we did adopt it, at least uh, we would have it available for any immediate need that Brian might have for showing this, that we do have the policy. So move, Mr. Chairman. Okay, we have a motion to adopt it as presented. Do we have a second? I can't Brian. second. No, I, I just have a suggestion. Are <laughs> Eben, are you seconding? Uh, and then we'll go to discussion. I was going to motion or I was going to motion that we send it to our attorney for approval from them first, because that was a recommendation for the league. Can can you come back to that if if we have a second? Are you making the second? Or, yes. Or, okay, we do have a second now. Motion is second. Evan has a suggestion that we send it to our attorney. Brian, you had something else you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I think that's a. a Pretty good idea. This is pretty straightforward, um, and it's a policy, not an ordinance. So it, it, sending it to the attorney is not the highest priority, but it's always a good idea to have an attorney look over. You know, ordinances especially, but policies are good too. Uh, the one thing that occurred to me, um, we should, I believe, add as a authorized purchasing agent, uh, the library director. Okay. 
Is is that a fr considered a friendly amendment to the motioner and the second? Aye. Yes. Yeah, okay. So we would have that addition and sent over to the attorney for review. I didn't agree to the attorney part of Evans. Okay, so that is a discussion item. The, the deal is $100 says this has been over and over and over by the league's attorney, attorneys. Beth, Nat? That's my question, is that if this is so similar to the league's proposal, so Evan, you said somewhere here you read that the league is recommending we put it past an attorney? Well, not in the draft for us, but in the big pamphlet from the league. Um, being that it's not an ordinance, maybe I was overthinking that one. I wouldn't say you're overthinking it. It's never a, a bad idea to run by anything that could tie our, run anything that could tie our hands by our attorney. You know, we'd hate to accidentally uh, create a situation where we are, uh, we, uh, we open ourselves up for some kind of liability or some kind of lawsuit because we didn't know something. I don't think that's the case here, but, and, and yeah, the, the league, I don't want to downplay it, but the league is always going to say that because they're not our attorney. Right. But they are attorneys. So they always want to kind of clear that, that they're not giving us legal advice. Um, so it, it's, it's always a good idea to consult our attorney. It's how much risk are we comfortable with? I think this is pretty low risk, but it's not nothing. No, I, I agree. If, if, if our language isn't that different than the leagues, I don't, and it's a policy, not a, an ordinance. I, I feel like it's not necessary. That's my feeling. I hate to agree with Mike, but. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> sometimes you just can't help it. <laughs> Stop clock and all that, you know. <laughs> Beth? Um, I just have, I am supportive of adopting a policy. I just have feedback on a couple of items. Go ahead. So when you say as is, I say no, not as is, because um, things like minor purchases, it talks about, first of all, for minor purchases, um, we just got the invoices and warrant from Anne, and I just scanned through how many of those items were over $500. And there are quite a few here that are, you know, 800, between 500 and 800. Um, and I think that's regular. So I would just, I don't want to know about baseball jerseys costing $650 every time they have to order for a sport for, through rec, for example. Um, and I know from experience that rec um, shirts often cost right around $700. Um, so I would just, recommend actually bumping that up a little bit, maybe to $800 uh, at the low end and having every anything below 800 being incidental. But um, yeah. Or a round number of a thousand. That's even sure. better. Sure. I guess I would I also like the round number because it's easy to remember. Uh, yeah. That was mostly why I, I, I chose a lot of round numbers in this with the idea being that ideally people don't have to pull out the policy and look that it's easy to remember what the steps are. Yep, is okay. That, is that considered a friendly amendment to the motioner and the seconder? Well, Eric, the, the seconder has already asked for an attorney. And so really you don't have a proper second for my first motion. That's not how that works. Yeah, he, he seconded it and then he added a comment that he preferred it went to an attorney. Okay. All right. So he didn't add attorney into it. No, no, he can't okay. do that. My, my mistake. Yeah. I, I didn't hear him quite right on that. I guess I had a little glitch. So on my computer, is it considered a friendly amendment to you to add uh, change that to a thousand for a minimum uh, minor expense? Yes. 
And for you, Evan, a seconder? Yes. Okay. Uh, Evan, you did express some concern with going to attorney. Uh, you've heard some of the other board members comfort level would you I think it's fine okay after I, I, hearing some other discussion a little more I, I think you're right I think it's as a policy um, and it is a boilerplate from the league they're usually uh, have been pretty well court tested legal tested any further discussion um, yes I have two more items one is that I think in addition to price and quality we should also consider whether it meets our timeline or not, um, because yeah. often that will be a deciding factor. Good in a word call, of Beth. Uh, and that's listed in a few different places. I have, I'll tell you, it's right in the purpose, it's in the purchasing authority, and it's later on too, but I didn't note it later on. But basically anywhere it references best possible price and quality, add best possible price and quality while meeting timeline requirements. Good one. Good catch. Is that also considered a friendly amendment? How many more do you have, uh, Beth? More. One more? Yep. Okay. Why don't you put them all together and I'll, and I'll agree to both of them. Okay, the other one is in the purchasing authority. Um, it talks about um, awarding um, for vendors that are local and having an allowance for vendors that are local. I would just like to um, add businesses um, for women, minorities, and or local um, within a 15% of lowest bid as an allowance as part of our acceptance of a bid. You okay. wanna put a, a number on that. I want to put a percentage of 15% and add women and minority owned businesses on top of local. I, I've I got women and minority owned businesses. Well, Pedro, you want that, That's another I'm place. On, that's in another place, Brian. I'm on uh, the second page. Sorry, there's not page numbers. <laughs> it took me a minute to catch it too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, you're right. It's it's listed in section two, but not in it's not repeated section in five. section five. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is there and I'm asking Brian because I don't know the answer. Is there any issue with having a percentage? And I'm guessing that they could come in at a higher up to 15% higher bid and they would still be considered over a low bidder. Is that how that's interpreted? That's how I would interpret that is that we're, you know, we say in, in here that we reserve the right, uh, we get into our reservations a little bit later, but in this purchasing authority, and we talk about it in the, uh, the affirmative action and local preference section, we, we talk about how we have the ability to make other choices than lowest bidder. And the way I'm interpreting Beth's suggestion is that we put a number on a couple of those choices. So it's not that we can choose, we don't have local preference for any amount, but we are saying that with, as long as it's not, as long as it's within 15%, so up to 15% higher. But still that doesn't mean we have to spend 15% more on that just to give the job to somebody no. else. So. Correct. It so. really gives us uh, less freedom when we put a number to it. You know that we're saying that we will, you know, we will give allowances for local, women-owned and minority-owned businesses, but we're we're not going to go over fifteen percent of uh, the cost of the project. That 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 there's a limit to how much preference we'll give for those areas that we are going to give preference for. So I mean, you basically, wouldn't, they need to be competitive. So you yeah. wouldn't just say preferential treatment to women, minority, local businesses. You would say preferential treatment up to a 15% uh, 
I'm not sure how you word that, but adder or whatever. And that's if that's allowable. I believe it would be, uh, but I, you know, I'm not an attorney. Um, it seems like something allowable to me. I, that doesn't seem. Our attorney might advise, might give us different advice on it, uh, but I don't see anything wrong with that. In the League of uh, Cities and Towns, they talk about the option of adding a limit uh, limit on. I don't know exactly where I saw that, but I definitely read no, it. No, you're right. I, I, let's see if I can find that. So if Pete Dodge put in a bid to replace a culvert and it was 15% higher, 115,000 versus Menashe's 100,000, we could, using this policy, pick Pete Dodge because he's local. Yes. Okay. We could also do that uh, under the way it's written right now. Is just the way it's written right now. Um, th there's no, there's no limit on. It. Right now, you we know? could pick him local for fifty percent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's putting direct limits on it. Uh, gives us, well, it gives us guidelines. It, gives, it we know when we're kind of in the the in what, what's a, an acceptable tolerance to us. If it's without guidelines, uh, you know, with guidelines, we know that we're gonna, you know, we're gonna give preference for these areas where we said we were gonna give preference as long as they fall within the guideline. If it's, if we don't have the guidelines, we could, you know, give it to people who are way over because we say that we value the preference. So it's a way that we could abuse it. Uh, we could also abuse it by you know, if we didn't really believe in the principles of, of local businesses, we could also deny it to the local businesses, even though they're only a little bit higher. If we just said, you know, that that doesn't meet the threshold for being preferential treat. Is this a common practice? I believe I've heard of it before. Okay. I'm not. I don't think I'm qualified to say whether it's common or not, though. Okay. I think Mike wants to ask a question. You know something? Uh, why couldn't a local contractor, if we were uh, putting something out the bid, read our policy and say up to 15% uh, for a local contractor and a 100,000 job, they could tack on $14,000 and say, hey, I'm local contractor here. They wouldn't know what the other bids are. Well, that's true. Yeah, you're right. So if they pad their bid, you know, we would, and we believe that they're padding their bid. Uh, well, if we believe they're padding their bid, we still don't have to choose. Them. Exactly. We, we, we still have our rights. We still have our rights to, uh, yeah. to choose who we think is going to do the best for the town. So uh, on two of uh, best amendments, I'll agree to them. Okay, so you accept that as a friendly amendment, both uh, changes that Beth has? Yes. Okay, as well as you, Evan, seconder? Yes. Okay, uh, before I open it up, uh, well, I saw her hand come up, but now it just disappeared. Is there any other board member comment if not is there any public comment yes there it is oh, we do have somebody from the public okay go ahead ken yeah i'd just like to say i, I really hope this board would heavily consider any local contractor that is qualified to do the business whether they are more than the other ones uh, heavily favored for the job in this area. Thank you, Ken. That is certainly something we take in consideration. Absolutely. I, I know you do. I was just further on. Okay. 
Thank you, Ken. Is there any further comment? Not seeing any. Uh, we have a motion and a second for the adoption of the uh, procurement policy with its uh, three changes that have been brought up. Is there any other discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? And that does require all of our signatures, correct? That's how I have it drafted. Yep. Um, it's That's a policy, so yeah, I would recommend that we leave it that way rather than making. So at everybody's convenience, just stop by the office and sign that. Yeah. Okay. The uh, EO, it's not EOP anymore, is it? It's uh, LEMP, the Local LEMP. Emergency Management Plan. <laughs> So we have made our updates to this plan. One second to pull this up. Uh, we're uh, having some trouble with this plan on uh, making a few updates to some of their classifications on, uh, on equipment, but it does detail to the best of our ability, it does detail our uh, the equipment we have available during an emergency. Has everybody seen the, the plan? As the select board, it's our responsibility to a, approve this plan. Uh, give me one second. By and large, the changes every year are just uh, adding and uh, changing any contact info, info for all of the uh, different department heads, officers, et cetera, as well as any new businesses that may have come into town with uh, hazardous materials. Everyone whose name is on this has agreed they would like to continue doing this, I assume? Or it's a, an officer who has a role in the community. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, the big change to this that we're looking at, I don't know if I'm running through it a little bit quickly, but the big change that we're looking at is creating a, uh, a supplement list for additional contact information for folks that aren't recognized in the local emergency emergency management plan, but people that we think might be useful to get a hold of. Uh, but that is not part of what we have to adopt uh, by a statute. And for example, you mean like David Manning as principal of Johnson Elementary? Is that who you mean? Uh, you no, he that? is in here right now. I'm thinking oh, people like for the, the supplement, the people that I'm looking at would be uh, you know, we talked about trying to get landlords over a certain size. They don't really have a recognized role, but in an emergency, that might be a number that would be helpful to have. Okay. Um, so it, it's not really our institutional contacts. It's, you know, kind of extra things that we think might be helpful. We talked about trying to get 24 hour numbers for a few more people, uh, especially some of our kind of outside contacts, people who might not uh, normally volunteer for to have a 24 hour number listed. We might ask them if we can include them in a, a supplemental doc. Essential businesses that we might need supplies in the middle of a, you know, event. Yeah. Yeah, Farm and Garden was one that came up in particular that we might need something from them in the middle of the night. And uh, that's not something that they would normally uh, that's not really their job. They're not a recognized part of the emergency system, but they might be willing to provide that to us anyway. So we're going to, to ask and create a supplement for it. Uh, I think they've offered that in the past. Yep. Yeah. And this is, this is something I learned. <clears throat> I learned, uh, um, well, it's something for board members to um, 
keep this document handy um, and and at the ready um, in case something does happen and Eric's not around and um, you know it's just one of those things that we need to know to keep handy. That's all. So the board members have any questions or is the board uh, prepared to approve? So move, Mr. Chairman. Motion, do we have a second? Second. Motion is second, any more discussion? None from the board, any discussion from the public? And I'm not seeing any hands. No more discussion. All those members, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? We have the adoption. Class four highway. All right, so the planning commission was tasked with helping us update our class four road policy uh, and helping us in particular with our class four road policy and uh, kind of the, the obligations that the town is going to have with the uh, increased expected maintenance of class four roads, that, that the, the new nature of class four roads and the municipal roads general permit means that we have a greater obligation to manage erosion on class four roads. Uh, and that obligation isn't coming with any additional funds from the state. So we're going to have to manage that with the, our existing money. And it's a, uh, a very significant obligation that, that we could undertake. Um, so we're we tasked them with uh, developing that. And also uh, as an additional interest, um, you know, we're concerned about the, the impact of just turning class four roads and turning them up to trails. Uh, we'd still maintain a public right of way, but a home on a trail uh, that versus a class four road that could have a pretty significant impact on uh, homeowners property value. Um, it would have a pretty significant impact on, it's a still a public right of way, but there's a real different impression between uh, a road and a trail. So it, it could be a pretty negative impact on uh, the public's use of some of our back roads. So th there's some concerns that we really have to weigh and consider. Uh, did we just lose Beth? No, we're her camera, okay. Um, I'm here, sorry. No, that's all right. I, you just moved in the order, so I thought you had gotten disconnected. Um, yeah, so th those are some of the issues that we asked them to consider. Uh, they're coming back to us with uh, taking another pass at it, looking in more detail at hydrologically connected road segments. Those are the segments where we have the new obligation under the municipal road general permit. So those are the, the segments that we might have some increasing uh, obligation. Uh, so the, those are the road segments that are gonna cost us more money in the future than they do today. So that's kind of our, our key and the, the biggest place that we have a financial impact on this. What they came up with uh, a number of different suggestions on this and uh, there had been some interest in having the select board review the rest of the document. So not just the list of roads that they want us to reconsider, but also look at some of the policy changes that, that they're suggesting. And so I prepared a draft uh, and I'm, I'm interested in getting your feedback before we send it on to the planning commission about how it represents the town's position. Um, so I want to get into that kind of in detail, discuss my comments. Does anybody have any questions about the class four roads or, uh, the planning commission's role 
before we get into the, the red line document in particular. And the red lines are the ones you have changed, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, I did not make a draft that compared their updated policy to our current existing class four road policy. I just made the places I would change to their, their draft policy. So does anybody have any questions or are we ready to have Brian just walk us through his changes that he's proposing? Okay. I guess you want to bring it up? Yep. Walk us through it. Okay, can you read that okay? Yes. Yep. All right. So it starts out with just a little bit of background and the basis for establishing the policy. Pretty straightforward. Um, I just had a couple terminology questions of, um, you know, it's not that they are, it says it, in their drafted, and I think this was language taken from our current class four road policy, uh, which says they are not eligible for female reimbursement. That's not 100% true. Uh, it's, they have very limited eligibility. They will, most damages we can't recover anything for, but under some specific circumstances, we might be able to recover some costs for class four roads. Uh, then it says the statutes allow towns to provide maintenance to bridges and culverts. Well, they, the statutes actually require us to provide maintenance on bridges and culverts. So that's one of the areas that we do have an obligation for on a class four road. If we install a bridge or a culvert on a class four, it's ours in perpetuity. Um, that's a big reason why we wanna be very careful about installing bridges and culverts on class four roads is uh, they become an ongoing obligation. Uh, but otherwise, class four roads have virtually no obligation for maintenance. Um, we get into definitions of class four roads. Again, it gets a little, uh, Class one, two, and three are pretty well defined. Class four roads are roads that are not class one, two, or three. Well, they're more defined by what they aren't. Uh, about all it says in statute about class four roads is that class four roads are not necessarily passable year round. Uh, we go into a little bit of detail about changes in classification. This is not really a change. They don't really suggest any changes, any major changes to our current policy, which is that we generally discourage uh, upgrading or uh, degrading the classification of class four roads. If a homeowner or if a petitioner wants to change the classification and upgrade a road, they should bring a, a they should collect a petition, bring it before the select board uh, to petition a road to be upgraded from class four to class three. The, one of the expectations before the board uh, adopts that change would be that the road is brought up to class three standards. So that the road bed is improved uh, and the construction standards with everything it, it meets what we would consider a class three road. Then the select board would discuss the kind of public good of this being a class three instead of a class four. Are we willing to undertake the increased regular maintenance of a class three road for this road in particular? Uh, so we would want to talk about what not, not just the good to the residents who live on the road, but to the general public. What is a, an average resident of Johnson going to get out of us paying more money to maintain this road, of, of us taking on an additional obligation. It's a similar process if we're going to degrade a road. Uh, it, a petitioner would come before the select board, suggest that they will think that this road should be degraded from, you know, we're talking about class four, so they'd say this should be a, not a class four road, we should change this to a three. So we would want to discuss what's the public good and how is the public served by us changing 
the classification from a class four road down to a trail. There aren't any construction standards for trails, so there's no really construction piece. So we would really just be what public good is served by us changing the classification of this road. I, I don't have any recommended changes to that section. Maintenance by town is where we get into um, a number of changes. Uh, some of these are, some of my suggestions are formatting changes. Um, but I wanted to, let's see, for class four roads, I wanted to uh, be pretty clear <clears throat> that we're not going to provide any summer maintenance of class four roads, you know, except to the extent required by necessity and the public good and convenience of the inhabitants of the town when staff and financial resources allow. So if we have the money and the time and it's serving the public good, again, it's serving the average person in Johnson, not just the people who live on the road, we can consider uh, additional maintenance on class four roads. Winter is similar. We will not provide any maintenance of class four roads during the winter unless it meets those certain circumstances. And again, for both of these, anything we do in no way obligates us to additional work in the future. This isn't a real departure from uh, what the Planning Commission had said, I don't think, but I wanted it to be kind of abundantly clear. Uh, so I use a little bit wordier language uh, on this to make it abundantly clear. We're not doing anything in the summer unless we have time. And even if we have time this year, it doesn't mean we have time next year. And we're not doing anything in the winter except under similar circumstances. And it's not terribly different than what the, the town had or what the, the planning commission had. I just um, thought it, it benefited from being a little bit clearer. Uh, one of the sections here, um, they recommend in the policy that we uh, create a line item in our highway budget for maintenance on, on class four roads and that we start funding that line item um, kind of in detail, uh, that we do regular inspections and um, you know that we, again, Pay, we, we set aside more funds than we currently are uh, in, in our budget for the maintenance of class four roads. So we do more of those things that we said were optional. Um, I'm not really objecting to that as a practice or a principle, but I don't think that that should be specified in uh, a policy or, or, I think that we should do that at our discretion rather than kind of issuing a command saying that we will do it. That's something that we should uh, kind of retain strictly to the select board's own authority uh, to look at how much money we, are, we spend and how often we inspect class four roads at, at our discretion. There's some merit to laying it out uh, kind of more cleanly like it is here, uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't, I wouldn't recommend it. I recommend that we kind of just strictly retain that authority to the select board itself. Uh, they've got a paragraph here that- Well, I can like. I just take a note, sorry, on that yeah. class four road budget line. We already have a class four road maintenance budget line looking yes. at this year's budget. So, okay, I just want to make sure that that was known. Yeah, it, we do have a class, we do have a budget line in class four roads. Uh, we don't assign very much money to it. And we usually, we often don't spend it. Um, we usually, it's more time than it is money, but it, we're also, you know, don't want to spend yeah. the money too uh, on it either. Um, but this suggests that we do more work on class four roads. I think that that's something that has merit in discussion, but I don't think it's something that should, we should obligate ourselves to. 
Uh, there's a statement at the end about maintenance by the town um, that says, you know, in the event of emergencies, such as fire or medical emergencies, the town will make reasonable attempts to assist emergency vehicles, but we accept no responsibility uh, if you can't, if emergency vehicles can't get through. Um, I think that that sounds pretty good in principle. I, I think that uh, anytime we're talking, I, I'd like that reviewed by an attorney of, uh, you know, are we obligating ourselves to anything that we're not anticipating when we make statements like that about our responsibility in emergency emergency situations? Um, that's that's an area that it's good to be cautious around. So I, I'd like that one reviewed before we adopt any language like that. Uh, in the next section, we get into maintenance work by others. Uh, this should be covered in our right-of-way policy. And we might make some modifications to our right-of-way policy, but in an effort to make all of our policies a little bit easier to navigate and read, uh, we shouldn't mix the two of them up. Whatever is in the right-of-way policy, anything about right-of-way should be in our right-of-way policy. And anything about uh, that, you know, strictly class four roads uh, should either make reference to it or, um, you know, stay silent on the matter. It, that that it, it's potentially confusing to have, to, to kind of intertwine them this way. So I think there's some merit into discussing their suggestions, but not in this policy. So I've cut this whole section. Uh, controls and protection, you know, what we're reserve, what we reserve the right for is good. The way that we're granting permission is good. Uh, I think the section on overweight vehicles is kind of unnecessary uh, because we talk about this in our controls and protections that we, we talk about weight limits and overweight vehicles. Uh, so it either can be cut or it can be consolidated into uh, the other section, uh, but we don't need it. I don't believe that we need it twice. Uh, I would cut the disputed right of way situations and under their suggestion, uh, the town would be responsible for uh, burden of proof about where the right of way for a road is. Uh, the general assumption is that the right of way for the road is based on where the road currently is. Um, so I think that we should not give up that right uh, by assuming the, the town would always have the responsibility to prove uh, the right of way for a road. And that is by statute or standing uh, I believe it's specifically through case law, not case statute, law. but okay. it, it is the practices of, you know, that the, the center of the road is wherever the center of the road is. Right. Um, you know, so as long as you can establish the center of the road, uh, the, the assumption is that the road is in the right place. Uh, so yeah, I wouldn't want the I would not advise that the town give that that assumption up. Uh, and that's the extent of my changes or suggested changes to the uh, policy as drafted by the planning commission. Okay, open it up for board member comments. Mike? So basically, Brian, this is all done except for that one section that you wanted to be checked out by the attorney, correct? Uh, and the roads that we're thinking about changing uh, is still on the planning commission and the planning commission might have some comments about my suggested changes. Got it. Uh, so I think the next step would be to send this back to the planning commission and I wouldn't take it before the attorney until the town and the planning commission have a, a draft that we agree. Ah. Got it. But but there was that one part that you thought that the attorney should look at, though. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't object to taking it out or leaving it in. But anytime we mention liability uh, and assuming liability or assuming that we don't have liability, I, I yeah. think we should have that reviewed by an attorney. Yeah, yeah, I, I have to agree with you on that. And probably when this whole thing's done, we would just submit the whole uh, ordinance to them anyhow to have them brush over it. Well, uh, this this will be a policy uh, rather than an ordinance. Well, that's true. Yeah, uh, uh, but this is a good example of we're really crafting this. Like I, I've made reference to the uh, model policy that uh, VLCT provides for Class Four roads. Uh, I borrowed some language from them, but we're this is mostly whole cloth. Uh, we're we're not just dropping our name in and a couple dollar amounts. This this, is, this really bears review. Where was the section on uh, the highway discontinuation recommendations? That was all in this area you crossed out? Uh, no, the, the, you're talking about the specific roads? Yeah. Uh, that's in a, a supplement to this oh, that I, I didn't okay. mark up. Okay. Um, because there, there's, I don't really have any, I don't have any particular feedback uh, to offer about that until they Take a look at the hydrologically connected road segments. Okay. Yep. Uh, and then we can get into yes, this road, you know, this many feet on this road. No, we want to keep the, the, those specifics aren't really worth getting into at, at this point. Can you send that to me? I don't think that, I think that is what I don't have. I think okay. it's like missing it as possible. And there is quite a process that we would must we would have to do for any highway th uh, throwing up or reclassification. Every single one of the highways, the board would have to go and and view the highway before having a public hearing, at least one public hearing, and well publicized and yep. any abutting landowners invited. It's quite a process. Yeah, yeah, it's the process laid out here for reclassifying roads. It, it's basically the same. This lays out a pretty good description of what that process is going to be. It's going to be, it's going to be lengthy for each section of road. And each one would be a separate hearing, a separate uh, viewing. Yeah. Yeah, we can do a, we can kind of do them back to back, so we don't have to spend. And if I don't have to be separate days, but right, we, we would, but they would it, be, it'll be quite a process when we reclassify any of these roads. And if I recollect correctly, they even had suggestions on some that would be upgraded to class three on their recommendation. I'd have to go back and look. I, I don't recall. Okay. And maybe I'm miss. Uh, speaking on that. Okay, well, what are board members' thoughts? Are we prepared to send it back to the Planning Commission with these yes. changes? Yes. Nat? Sure, yes. Evan? Uh, Beth? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Brian, for all that work. Yeah, excellent job, Brian. Thanks. Um, I don't see anybody from the public, but if you if there are members of the public who have comments. Scotty, I'm not sure if you're trying to raise your hand or so I'm gonna give you Chance to. Yeah, it's actually Kim, and I wondered if I could speak as a taxpayer. Sure, go ahead, Kim. Um, just the uh, two things. One, Brian, you had said the the information that you crossed out would be put under the right of way section, and I didn't see it there. I don't know if you hadn't moved it yet. Uh, that would be. We'd, have, we'd want to get into uh, the right-of-way policy, and that would be kind of a, a separate discussion. So we, we have not made that amendment to our right-of-way policy, but 
it, it, the appropriate place for it to be located is in the, the it, it is in the right of way policy. So we should discuss it and talk about making amendments to the, that policy. Okay, and, and I, I feel like it, as somebody who would be looking at a home on a class four road, I would want that information up front um, so that people know that they might need a permit in order to do maintenance on the road, summer or winter. And so if it doesn't go under that heading that it, it somewhere it should, you know, make reference to it's the information that that that's covering is under right of way. The other piece that I thought was important that um, was, I know it's money into a category that isn't necessarily being used all the time, but I feel like it's really important to have that money there for prevention, because as a taxpayer, when something blows out completely and um, there's big money, then all of a sudden we're slammed with it. Whereas if the roads are getting maintained properly, hopefully that that will be able to um, maybe prevent um, a big ordeal. And if it's not getting used, at least that money will be there for helping um, the, you know, condition of the road after storm or whatever it is that hits. And I think you were right, Eric, I think there might have been one road on Prospect Rock that was looking like it was almost class three and seeming that there was residents that were excited about that possibility. I think that was the one that might have been um, class one in class three reclassification. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thanks, Kim. And I think I saw Paul raise his hand too. Uh, yes, I did. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Kim actually brought up both the points that I was going to, but I'll reiterate very quickly. Um, Brian, if, if uh, the maintenance and permit required stuff, if you'd like us to address that elsewhere, um, if you could send me a copy of the right away policy so that we could consider sure. how it might fit into that, that would be great. Um, with respect to the budget items, um, I think you summed it up pretty nicely that um, we don't necessarily put a lot of money into it and that money we do put in, we don't always spend. And the idea behind the discussion the planning commission had was not so much that more money should be spent, but it should be spent regularly, uh, as Kim said, on preventative maintenance, trying to preserve the structure of the road. For example, we spent some time up on Reservoir Road where there's some pretty severe erosion after some of the storms and trying to prevent things like that. So we have to spend less money as a, in response because those are culverts that we're responsible for. So the idea was put a little bit of money aside, spend it, or if you don't spend it because there isn't a need, that's great, but keep it in that pot so you have it for the next year or the next year or the next year rather than having it disappear. That was the conversation we had, not necessarily spend more money on it. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Do we have anyone else? I think the point about referencing the right of way policy is a really good one. I actually wrote it down and then didn't say it. <laughs> yeah. Just something, just something like please reference under maintenance by other work by others in that same area, just saying uh, please reference right of way policy for additional information yeah. or something to that effect. That, that would be a good change to make there just reference well it sounds like paul and uh, kim were actually talking about a class four well the way that money would be moved from one year to the other is through a class four highway reserve fund is that correct and, right. and if so then let's see that would actually have to be approved by by voters right yes Yes, it would. Yeah, it's, it is an interesting idea, the, the example of um, that Paul uh, made on, on the reservoir road that uh, is an interesting point. 
Sorry, I'm going to add a note while we're So I just wanted to add a note to the draft before I send it back to the planning commission. You know, that that's something that we're interested in doing is adding that reference to the class four road policy. All right. Uh, I'm not seeing any other hands. Are we all set to send this over to planning commission? Yeah, thanks. Sensing all board members are nodding their heads. I can't see Evan, but. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. If there's no further comments, we'll send that over to the Planning Commission with our proposed changes. All right. Ted Alexander. So, Ted Alexander, Welcome Center is coming along well. Uh, the uh, let's see, the Ted Alexander Welcome Center, we uh, received approval from VTrans uh, to, uh, if you recall, part of this was, part of the plan is to uh, cut back a number of the trees uh, to increase the sight lines and make the Welcome Center more visible. Uh, that required, because that is a railroad right of way, uh, that required permission from the Trans Department of Transportation as it pertains to railroads. Um, so the, we have been given permission to do that. We've got to provide them some notice. They've got a few stipulations about how we take down the trees, but we've gotten approval from them. Our tree warden, I, I went out there with our tree warden about the trees that we want to cut down. And uh, a lot of the tags that we had marked trees with had come off. Uh, so we're going to go back and mark them again with something a little more permanent, um, you know, with paint or something to, to mark which trees are coming down. Uh, change to decrease views. Change so. Well, we, we got to get the approval first before we. I, I guess we, we can mark them with a chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> Um, then they'll come down. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it, that was a good one, Brian. <laughs> uh, so we're uh, we're moving ahead with that first step of uh, clearing the trees. Uh, we've also had some good news on the Act 250 front that we uh, have received approval to submit this project as an administrative amendment to the original um, uh, uh, trailhead building that was uh, submitted back however many years ago by uh, Leah Kilbody, uh, that she had created a good, well-written permit uh, that we can expand this as uh, a, a, an amendment or, or a continuation of the project that she started. You know, so. Her foresight deserves a lot of credit for continuing this. Um, and I know that she was, uh, she and Eddie Gale were very interested in, um, in, in how this project developed and how this went. So uh, yeah, we can still, still owe a great debt of gratitude for her for this. Contributions continue. Anything yes. else? Yeah. Uh, once we have the approval from the uh, Act 250, uh, I've submitted our administrative amendment. I expect approval will come in pretty soon. As soon as we have that, they'll release the first of the payments to us. Uh, we'll start purchasing the uh, material, the fill and the lumber that we'll need to construct the welcome center. Um, and we'll go from there. Uh, I don't know if I'd provide an update to the board. The village had agreed uh, to provide some in-kind contribution uh, for the construction. They're, they're uh, going to provide uh, labor as a uh, donation uh, for the construction of, of the Welcome Center for the town. Good. Oh, cool. So we're on Brian's schedule. Brian uh, Raleighanitis' schedule for um, construction. 
I'd have to check with Howard and uh, Doug about how we're fitting into Brian's schedule. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm more uh, in the loop on where we are with public works. Okay. All right. Well, maybe I'll give him a call. I, uh, I'm anxious about this project just because we have such a tight uh, deadline. Yeah. Uh, but sounds like you're making some good headway. Um, in terms of um, trees, once trees are downed, uh, I don't know what sort of trees you're falling, but if we could offer the, the, the wood to the um, bread oven committee, I think that'd be great. Sure. Good suggestion. Yeah, I know a lot of it is more brush than proper trees. Uh, well, you know, that doesn't uh, make very good pizza. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's... I think we'd all be surprised if, given how dense that looks, once we take down the, the honeysuckles and, and some of the other, uh, especially the invasive species and some of the other low trees, uh, how much better that's going to look and how clear that's going to look. I bet. Yeah. Good. Um, you know, we're going to take down a couple dead trees and we're going to take down a couple little bit larger trees, but not... not not much. You know, the, the, there's a couple of big cottonwoods there that uh, Noel was very interested in having us keep, and I, I don't believe those were planned by anybody to, to come down. Good. Any other comments? Any board members? Anybody from the public? Doesn't look like any. Okay, Brian. Uh, community project funding. All right. So, uh, you recall we had submitted three projects for uh, the community project funding from Representative Welch's office. Uh, this is kind of a, you know, this is very, very similar to earmarks, but, um, you know, they're not calling them earmarks anymore. Um, we weren't selected as one of the community projects for uh, Welch to take through negotiations. But uh, Senator Sanders is going to be another part of this same operation. And I believe that we'll probably see something similar out of Senator Leahy. Uh, we've spoken to uh, members of uh, Senator Sanders' office and they're interested in reviewing our projects and they might be advancing them. So we're not getting those projects through that avenue, but we're taking the same projects having another crack at the same pot of money through a different avenue. Um, about the uh, the light industrial park in particular, uh, that is also being submitted as a priority project for funding from the state uh, through cooperation with the LEDC. Um, and we're also going to be taking um, we're also going to be considering uh, funds we have from ARPA as possible matching funds for the grant uh, that we've kind of targeted, we had targeted previously through the uh, EDA, the Economic Development Authority. Um, and we were having, we we're kind of shut out from that grant because they want a great deal of cash on hand uh, in order to approve the project. Um, and we might be able to use those ARPA funds as our cash on hand to obtain the grant. And if we have cash to secure the grant, we can use in-kind contribution to reduce our, uh, what we might have to pay for it. So we might be able to reuse those funds. We can use them as matching as securing a match, then use in-kind contribution to reduce our actual exposure, and then use the funds again a second time uh, for either another grant application or um, for some other community project. So we might be able to get a lot of mileage out of the ARPA funds if we're allowed to. Uh, the guidance on how to use ARPA funds has not been released. Uh, so this is still very high in the sky. Um, but all three of our projects still have interest and still have uh, 
some chances at getting funding. So we're going to continue to pursue them. All that work was not for a wasted effort. We nope. Keep going. No, nope. and doing. we've got some really good work that we can use, uh, especially for the welcomes or the light industrial park and the recreation fields that we'll be able to, uh, when we have other opportunities come up, uh, we'll have some plans ready to submit and a lot of the documentation done, which will make us a lot more nimble for making those applications in the future. Perfect. Anybody got any questions for Brian? I'm just wondering if we can improve. I mean, we have some time now on the projects we submitted. Can we improve them while we, while we wait to resubmit? through Sanders and Leahy, um, because if we can make them as attractive as possible for economic development, we should. And we, you know, I'm eager to see economic, economic development move forward at a pace, not and not a snail's pace, at a quicker pace. Um, so anyway, any way we can make it more attractive in pitch and make it a little shinier, I think we should take advantage. Yeah. I, I think we can take another crack at writing the narrative and tightening it up. Um, yeah, we'll see how we'll see how it goes. I might suggest, um, you know, depending on what application we go to, uh, we may or may not want to include the uh, kind of model building that we talked about for the light industrial park. Uh, that is our kind of least well put together part for this. We were able to obtain some estimates on the construction for this. Uh, I'd like to shout out for, Greg was able to help me get in touch with a builder who provided some uh, estimates on that at, at a pretty short order and a quick time, quick turnaround for our first uh, application through uh, uh, Welch's office. But that is not as well developed as some of the other parts on the application. So we can put some effort into kind of beefing that up um, and seeing if we can really make it as good as the rest of the application. Uh, but in some cases, it might be better to cut it, cut it out, uh, uh, depending on, on what the application is and what they're looking for. Um, these are good projects. Uh, through Welch's office, it was a good decision. Uh, because that was a very, it was good for us to reach and be very ambitious in that grant. And it was also good for us to demonstrate scalability that um, that pot of money and that process for obtaining it is going to be through negotiation. So uh, the way Welch's office had described it is they want to be able to take things that can, you know, work at, um, you know, $5 million or, you know, $500,000. Like they want projects that can scale up and down and will make use of whatever money they can secure. Uh, and, and so including extras like that, that we in the narrative offered that, you know, if we get less money, this is something that can be cut from the project. You know, if we get a little bit less money than that, this is something that could be cut. So being able to articulate that was really good for that application. Um, but yeah, they, they can always be improved. Good. Any other board member comment? Or any, uh, oh, we go, Greg. Yep. Okay, Greg. Hey, I'm thinking about maybe what would make that more attractive and uh, I don't know, maybe if we threw like a building in there for the food shelf, they need to get something maybe different there. But, you know, trying to think like one of these senators would think and. Um, Stop think, thinking. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they might, that might tune it up a little bit um, somehow food shelf or uh Maybe you guys can come up with some other good things that might make it a little more attractive, I guess. I think a municipal building is great or, you know, a, par a park, a business park. I, I don't know Senator Sanders 
would look at that too close. But but anyway, I don't know. I was just thinking about some other way to entice these folks a little bit. And uh, and board, I'm sure, can come up with some things. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Any other comments? I got one from Kim or Scotty. Thanks. Sorry, his computer doesn't have the um, raise the hand, so I can only clap. Um, <laughs> just to tack on when Greg was saying was, uh, you know, think of fun things to put there that they'd want to fund daycare, daycare center. There'll be a lot yep. of money in that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we definitely need to think about at some point our, uh, you know, we've been the food shelf and, you know, we've been donating space to them for years and years and years, but it's, it's a uh, pretty inadequate space. And depending what maybe settled in that uh, uh, light industrial park, it could really complement a food shelf. If it's a food co-op type of businesses yeah. that come in there. Or a child care, child yes. care center, same thing. You know, go to work, drop off your kid. Daycare center is huge. And I will tell you that my daughter is almost 19 and daycare has been an issue her entire life um, trying to find a daycare provider. Um, it's a definitely an in need uh, business. And I'm sure people would jump at the opportunity to work in an industrial park. Okay. Uh, I think Greg's got his hand up again. Hey, Greg. Okay. Yeah. Um, there is a group trying to work on a daycare in town. Uh, um, I, I don't have a lot of details on it, uh, but I have been involved in it somewhat. So um, just to let you know, if I when they get a final uh, plan together, uh, I'm sure they'll be reaching out to the board. Great, thanks, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Any further comment? Okay, if not, move on. Before we circle back into the additions, I keep forgetting to bring this up. Brian, would you pass on to Hugh that on the Pearl Street Bridge, one of the lamps is out. I, I believe it's a center one on the east side. He probably would have to get the village to help change it, but it's been out for some a significant amount of time. Sure. So probably if we jump into uh, Lois's uh, grant request. That might be a good thing to take up. All right, so I'm going to share my screen again for So uh, the Planning Commission, as you recall, a number of years ago, they made a, uh, a series of videos promoting uh, kind of awareness and uh, ways to recognize and ways to deal with the emerald ash borer. Uh, and if you haven't seen the videos, they're a, a lot of fun. Um, so I, I highly recommend watching the videos and, and we'll make sure they get uh, circulated again. But they have an opportunity uh, to um, submit for a grant to make a few updates on our uh, existing videos. And this is the draft of the application that Lois has. Uh, I'm gonna ask Lois if there's anything she'd like to fill the board in on. Uh, I guess one of the things I wanna say on a scale of what you've been talking about money-wise. We're not asking the town for any money and the grant request is only for $600, but it's 
through the uh, Association of Conservation Commissions, for, which the town is a member of. And the original videos that we made, which included a couple of short videos and some PSAs, um, were done in 2015 before the Emerald Dash Bora arrived. Now that it's here, the updates are needed because it just doesn't sound right to say it's coming when it's actually here. So we're hoping uh, the videographer, uh, Krista Barnes, who, who did it with us, and it was the uh, regional invasive uh, task force that had gotten the original grant that we had worked with at the Conservation Commission, and now this is through the Conservation Commission. And what we're looking for is the endorsement of the select board, because we know that AVCC likes to have that. Okay, thank you, Lois. What's the board's pleasure, or is there any questions for Lois? Well, you know those those videos that were made some years ago. They were they were fabulous, and um, they got some buzz. You know, they did have some. They were effective, I thought, because uh, people watched them, and, and they did kind of get out there through YouTube and and uh, the public access. Uh, the message back then was don't move firewood because then, uh, you know, that's what helps spread this stuff. So what's the message now, all these years later, Lois? How's the message changed? Well, the message is, is um, still don't move firewood because that's still yeah. moving it along. It's not here in Johnson, but it's around us. Um, yeah. But within the video, it says that it's coming and, it, and it's actually here. And there's um, maps with where it, well, there's a beautiful map of, of where it was in 2015. And Vermont stood alone as not having any. Right. So you look at that map and that's not true. So it's, it's things like that that will be changing. And um, I'm sure that we'll come up with some real buzz beyond the don't move the firewood because of the people who we're working with on this are very creative. Yeah, but we'll probably still have Sue Lovering in her bug costume. <laughs> I was going to ask who it was. <laughs> well, Sue, Sue actually designed and uh, sewed that that costume, and it's still being used. She made two of them, and they're still being used through the various programs around. Good, good. Yeah. Well, Y'all did a great job with it, and uh, so I enthusiastically support this. Are you so moving? I am moving with uh, alacrity. We have a motion. Yeah. Do we have a second? Yeah, second. The motion is second. Any other discussion? I'm not seeing any, Brian, but I can only see a partial screen. Oh, I, I'm not seeing any uh, any discussion for this. Does anybody have a comment? Only. Um, no spoilers, so sorry, Nat. We don't want to know what happens, Lois. <laughs> <laughs> okay, seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Go forth, Lois. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll save the union negotiation uh, discussion uh, in the executive session for the very end. The item that I had that I was going to uh, talk to is the uh, policing options committee that we had in place. As you all know, uh, the two members from Johnson resigned. I spoke to Susan today and she shared that Hyde Park has no reps. Uh, she has been in contact with the select board from Wolcott and uh, it's not at the point where they are out soliciting at this point, uh, or in discussions with Hardwick, uh, they are just putting everything on the table and looking at all options, as you know, a responsible select board should probably do. Um, they would be looking at Hardwick. They would be looking at Morristown. Uh, they would be looking at the sheriff's department. One of the things that they feel is out there geographically, they're so far removed from. Uh, the sheriff's office, they feel like they're, uh, you know, they don't get the service that maybe they think that they would, should get or would get if there was somebody closer. Um, you know, obviously when they get into that, they probably would find the prices would 
be very competitive and the service would probably be very similar. Like I said, uh, <clears throat> I had a discussion today with Susan. Uh, she also uh, had, she did not see the value in reappointing new people to this committee and trying to pick up the pieces and carry on. Um, she also felt as, as I did that uh, Duncan's letter could be used as a guide and we could go forward with that. What she's going to her board tonight with, they are also meeting, is a proposal that has come out of her discussions with uh, Wolka is one or two select board members from each of the communities and they would get together and uh, discuss some of these different options, what came out of the uh, uh, Duncan's report and, and maybe looking at uh, mostly an intermunicipal agreement type of format. Uh, it was in her opinion that really the state police is not an option for us, but that would be something for the board members to discuss. But this intermunicipal agreement is something that, uh, as you guys recall, we just uh, had sent a letter of support to the uh, LCPC on being able to, to organize something like that. It would be for these members to look at, there are certain benefits and uh, pluses and minuses to having this kind of a policing service. Um, we would be in control of it but we also would be responsible for it in that uh, currently we have a contract with Roger and he manages you know, the hiring, the firing, any lawsuits that are brought is against uh, his office and we don't have any role or part in that. And our only thing is we sign the, on the dotted line and pay for whatever the contract agreed to, to be is. Uh, Hyde Park has already started that outreach to LCPC about their uh, possibility of, you know, participating in some kind of fashion like this. As well as uh, Roger has been in discussions with Susan and he, he has some help that he could provide to even looking at this intermunicipal um, agreement. And this would take care of a problem that the sheriff's office has with uh, retaining officers, and that's the uh, retirement element. Uh, is an intermunicipal uh, uh, group, they would be eligible for uh, the municipal retirement plan. So there are pluses, and like I said, pluses and minuses to it, but it'd be more the uh, role of that group of select board members from each of the three uh, towns to really look at the different options, take what came from uh, uh, Duncan's letter and, and go forward with it. That's about where her and I discussion, I guess, went. Uh, I said I would be bringing it to this select board as well tonight. I know my time is gonna be, I would struggle to participate in this because uh, the amount of time that uh, Mike and I are spending on the or will be spending on the, the uh, negotiations with the, the labor uh, union. Um, but I guess I'd look for board thoughts. Uh, do we have a couple of volunteers that would be uh, interested in participating uh, or at least one? All right, I don't understand the ask, I guess. Participating in what? Well, it would be the three communities uh, board members, one or two from each of the three communities meeting and looking at what this committee did come up with for some of their thoughts on different options and maybe looking at this intermunicipal agreement type of format and whether that would work for the three towns versus, versus having a Lamoille or state police or some other format. Basically, this the select board members would take over where the committee had, has uh, stopped. And Susan would be, she's thinking that she will be participating. So she would be a good one to lead the effort. So uh, it's obviously a, a 
area that I have interest in. Um, and I've done a lot of work in it and I'd be happy to continue. The downside of that is that I've done a lot of work in it and I've got some, you know, some pretty strongly held beliefs about um, how things how things work and how things should work. So that might be a liability for me being on the on that committee, but I'd certainly be willing. That's why I thought it would be a good balance if it was yourself and Beth. Boom, hit by the bus. Uh, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I mean, I'm definitely, certainly open to it. Um, I guess my hesitation is, I'm a little worried hearing that Susan has like a whole action plan, I have to just admit publicly, because uh, it sounds like she has a plan. Um, but that being said, I'm willing to be involved in it. And I guess I'm just looking for what the expectation is, because if the expectation is we're going to take the information that has already been gathered and um, create a report out of it without a recommendation, I've looked through a lot of materials myself. Um, I think creating a report is a good first step. I'm a little worried that it sounds like the leap to a CUD has already been taken <laughs> or it feels like it is headed that way. And I, that just is a red flag, I guess, for me. Um, but I'm willing to put the work in. I, I don't think it's that huge a leap that's that's happened. Uh, they've just started some of the legwork, having Ron reach out to LCPC, you know, testing the waters on their interests, um, basically looking at it. Uh, I guess in Susan's mind, and I would agree with her, it probably comes down to two options for us. Uh, I don't think state police, uh, while that would be significantly cheaper, would give us, provide the service that our communities have been expected and are used to. I don't think that uh, financially we could afford to have our own police department. Uh, so unless we were to have a hugely expanded Morristown police force or something along that lines, I don't see any of those as an option. I think it would probably come down to, excuse me, continuing with the Lamoille Sheriff's Department or developing a intermunicipal uh, policing force. One, and the only one, maybe the reason that Susan is wanting to look at this is because, uh, you know, she realizes, like everyone else, that uh, Roger's not going to be there forever. And while he's been very active, Gardner was very active in having a patrol service, a new sheriff someday will be elected, and that's not something they have to provide. That's something they do because they want to. And uh, this contract could go away in one election. So it's something just to think about. Um, like I said, she has done some of the getting Ron started, at least getting some of the background information. It is something that Wolcott is interested in looking at, seeing if that would be a better option than what they currently have with the Sheriff's Department. But I think they will probably find the cost is probably no less, and it, it may even be more to have an agreement such as that. Uh, That's what I'm wondering is where's the cost savings in it? It's, I mean, it's just a different structure, but then you're paying a, you know, then you're, you've got the buildings and you've got all the, the overhead that. One of the only things that seems to pop out in the, in the immediate forefront is uh, the benefit to the retirement that the, the, as a way of retaining the officers, because Roger has a huge problem keeping officers. They jump to uh, you know any openings because of the retirement benefits that state police and municipalities have, and he cannot offer. Uh, Susan did tell me that <clears throat> like very, very recently within uh, a month or two, uh, the state treasurer has offered up and allowed Washington County Sheriff to put officers patrol or whatever kind of officers, deputies into uh, the retirement, state retirement fund. And so there's 
some kind of a question here, what's going on? Because Roger's been trying to do this for years and the state treasurer has not allowed uh, Lamoille. So uh, we're the step headed, uh, step, red headed step child, I guess. Uh, Somebody's got a lot of pull. Yeah, that's really curious. Yeah. Or we don't know the whole story. We don't. Uh, Susan just found this out recently and uh, I think she's gonna be checking in with a few of her contacts on, hey, what's the story here? I bet she is. <clears throat> but uh, the matter at hand is, uh, uh, you know, we've, what's the board's thoughts on this? The select board's uh, taking this ball from where the committee left it and uh, trying to use what they did all the work with and background information they've gathered and seeing if we can uh, look at a couple of different options. Uh, we, we do owe something to the voters at some point. Uh, I was thinking uh, Nat, because of his experience with the sheriff, he does have a lot of background knowledge that that would be a, a good fit. And Beth, you had expressed interest in knowing some of what's involved. And it, it's a, it would be a good eye opener for yourself to see everything that the, the sheriff's office does. Um, and I thought that's why you'd be a good fit. Something that, you know, Susan brought up and it's something that I know is very well aware of, but a lot of people may not realize it, that uh, there's a lot of money that Roger brings into the patrol uh, from other sources that he gets, either it's grants or uh, uh, some, uh, well, the, the- Other contracts. Yeah, you know, some of the contracts. And when they, they do a huge bus, sometimes there's, uh, you know, personal property that is part of that deal. And when that's auctioned off, there's sometimes money that comes to the sheriff's office and he channels a lot of that into a, a patrol budget. So there is some benefit that we've benefited from with sh the sheriff's office that we would not necessarily get if we were in a, some kind of an inter-municipal agreement. It's all things to look at. And, uh, Along with potential reduction in services, you know, whether we could continue with 24 hour service. Right. Which, I don't know. Okay. Well, I, I really appreciate it if you both would, uh, would do this. Excellent choices, Eric. <laughs> That's because you're off the hook. <laughs> yeah, I tell you what, we got enough to worry about. Uh, you want to, maybe they want to trade with us. <laughs> I think that's a good idea, actually. I'm good. Okay. Uh, unless anybody's got any questions, that's about as much, I think, as I got out of my oh. conversation with Susan. What are our marching orders then? Do we get in touch with Susan and set something um, up? I'll, I'll call her tomorrow and just let her know that, that you two are the volunteered and uh, we got two reps from Johnson. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have any further business before this board? And looking once, twice, gone. I would entertain a motion to enter into executive sessions to discuss con uh, labor contract negotiations. So move, I don't have the book chapter and verse in front of me. Unless somebody does, but, they can make the motion. I don't have the chapter title, but uh, because premature uh, uh, premature public knowledge of our uh, negotiation status and posture would disadvantage the town. Yep, that's it. That was your motion? Okay. There was. Do we have a second? second. The motion second. is second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Those opposed, please show us in executive session at 919. And Eric, just for the benefit of other folks here, uh, we're not expecting any action when we come back into any, any board, board action when we come back. So there's no, no sense in hanging around. Thank you, Nat. Yeah, that was good of you, Nat. Good, good evening, so, everyone.